Alas, poor Intel. I knew him, Ryzen. A chip of infinite ring bus and execution ports. It has booted my virtual machines a thousand times. And now, how abhorred in my imagination it is. My stomach rises at it. No pun intended. Here, in those bits that I have flipped, I know not how often. Where be your clocks, your voltage, your cash? Ha! <laughs> Mostly I'm kidding. Uh, so, the problem is, you want to run Linux as your host OS, or, you know, another free and open operating system, because honestly, it kills you a little bit inside to run an operating system like Windows or Mac OS, because you don't know what it's doing. It's not really respecting your freedoms. You don't really know what's going on. But, uh, you know, you want to play some games and do some stuff. I understand. I get it. Me too. That's how that works. Well, there have been some updates to the Ryzen platform as of mid-June 2017, and uh, things are looking up for GPU pass-through, that is, being able to run Windows. I'm running the Heaven benchmark in Windows here, um, under Linux, in a Windows virtual machine on Linux, on a Ryzen system. So right now, we're actually using this uh, Ryzen 7 1800X system with 16 gigabytes of RAM, I think, 8 gigabytes for the Windows virtual machine, 8 gigabytes for the Linux host, and it's pretty stable, it actually does work. There was an update for the Ryzen platform from AMD. Uh, it was called, it's called the Egiza platform. It's like the microcode platform for AMD. And so version 1006 or 1.0.0.6, depending on what your motherboard manufacturer is, uh, has been released by AMD, which solves a number of problems around virtualization. See, it used to be the case that the peripherals of the system and the peripherals that were to be passed through to the virtual machine, there wasn't really good separation. You need the hardware, you need to ask the hardware to perform that separate uh, separation for you in order for it to really work and make sense. Well, with the latest Giza update 1006, it's there, it works. Um, we've actually got a couple of different systems for you and this is gonna be a sort of a build guide of sorts. Now, it's not a perfect situation still. I'm, you know, it pains me to report that it actually on certain X99 systems, you are actually gonna have a little bit better experience, but it's mostly down to optimization problems and there are some workarounds. So if you've got an itchy trigger finger and you wanna get a Linux machine, but you don't wanna give up Windows gaming entirely, I'm gonna show you how to set this up, but I'm also gonna show you how to set up something that I call dual booting. Not D-U-A-L booting, but D-U-E-L booting. So dual booting, what does it mean? It means that you just really, you install Windows to this hard drive, it could be an SSD, it could be NVMe, it could be anything, just as you would normally. So there's no, Linux is not part of the equation. Set up Windows, install your drivers for your graphics card. I'm not sure that I would install system chipset drivers just yet. Uh, and you can install the Vert IO drivers from Red Hat if you want. You can download those and, and install them, even though it's not in a virtualized environment. It's just booting on the raw machine. And then when we boot into Linux, we hook up our Linux hard drive and then boot into Linux. We can tell Linux, the virtualization software, hey, instead of using a disk image, use that physical SSD and it'll boot Windows from the physical SSD. So you can use one Windows image to power both bare metal booting and booting inside a virtual machine. It's actually really cool. The really, really cool thing is if you use Windows 7, the performance is not as good with Windows 7 as it is with Windows 10, but with Windows 7 you can do a thing called seamless mode where you can actually run Windows applications seamlessly with your Linux applications, meaning that like if you need to run Outlook or a legacy application, it looks and acts like a, a native GNOME application or a native you know, application on Linux with the GNOME window dressing or your window manager's window dressing. But everything actually is running on a virtual machine. Uh, you can't do that on Windows 10 yet. There are some bugs around that. There's some entries in the Bugzilla thing. I don't think anybody's working on that, but hopefully soon somebody will be working on that because it's kind of cool. If you use like Cubes OS or something like that, we've got a video on Cubes that may already be out or maybe out soon, depending on when this video comes out. You've got some options. But for now, let's not lose track of what the point of this video is, because I do that a lot. I just sort of want to explain the situation. Now, we're using Fedora 26, which is not out yet as of the time of this video, but probably will be out around the time the video is actually released, because they're getting really close with Fedora 26. So that means we're running kernel 4.11, the very latest version. I don't know if that'll be the release version that they use, but probably. Um, you really need a bleeding edge version of the Linux kernel. We're using an ASRock X370 Tai Chi, 
we're also using a Gigabyte Gaming 5. These are my top two picks right now among boards that I've tested for virtualization, and we'll go into why in just a minute. Okay, let's talk for a second about some of the hardware support that's in Ryzen for this stuff. Um, AMD has an advanced interrupt controller called the AVIC, and generally you want to use something like the advanced interrupt controller. So with this kind of virtualization, the software, the virtualization software, can actually tell the hardware a little bit about what's going on with the virtualization so that the virtual machine can actually have some of what it needs done handled directly by the hardware. This is really great. This is what enabled things like Linus's 7 Gamers 1 CPU thing because the penalty for doing that level of virtualization is very minimal. Um, and so you can run a lot of virtual machines. And this is going to be really important in the enterprise for, you know, when Epic and Threadripper hit the enterprise. Ryzen 7 is a little different. Really, honestly, AM4 is a very modest platform. The motherboards are relatively uncomplicated versus all of the other stuff, which means that costs can be driven lower, which is really good for consumers. The trade-off is that it's a very new platform. So there are still some wrinkles. Now, to be fair, when X99 first launched, this type of thing was actually, I think, more problematic than it currently is on Ryzen. So that's, you know, that's worth something. I'd say probably another three to six months of development, and this thing is gonna be turnkey. The other thing that's really impressive is that the virtualization setup in Fedora is one of the easiest that I've seen. You can be up and running with this type of virtualization in about 30 minutes, give or take. You can edit a couple of things, run Dracut, and update your you know, initial RAM disk, and you're basically good to go. And I'm gonna show you that step by step. But I wanna explain what's happening a little bit under the hood first. So Ryzen supports the Advanced Virtual Interrupt Controller, the AVIC, and it also su supports something called nested page tables, meaning that the memory tables, without getting like overly complicated, when the operating system allocates stuff in memory, there is a memory management unit that is dealing with the hardware end of the memory. And so with Windows running as a virtual machine, uh, it would be nice if Windows would just sort of pass off control of that to the actual MMU. But the MMU in hardware sort of needs to know that Windows is a virtual machine and not the actual real honest to goodness operating system. Not only that, Windows might want to run virtual machines of its own, or at least have virtual access, like uh, virtual memory space, in other words, for some processes. So uh, there's this feature called nested page tables, NPT, and generally if you enable that, things work really well. Sometimes devices will actually use a memory mapped region for I.O. So it's like, hey, I need to copy this thing, this huge file to the graphics card, for example. So uh, the system might just allocate a region of memory and everything dumped into that region. It's not actually going to the memory, but is going into the graphics card. A, a little bit of an oversimplification, but just so you know what's going on under, under the hood. Now the AVIC and NPT are disabled by default. And theoretically, you should get better performance with AVIC and NPT enabled. So there is a Linux kernel module called the KVM and the it's like kernel virtual machine. And so the AMD version of KVM, KVM underscore AMD, you can pass some options to enable NPT and AVIC. However, in my own testing, enabling them causes problems. So you don't actually want to, to do that. The trade-off is that IO performance is perhaps not as good. So if you're doing, even when you're doing a vert IO for your virtualization, which is a very lightweight type of virtualization versus fully emulating SATA. So there's a drop down menu in uh, your virtual machine manager. And in your virtual machine manager, you can pick, hey, I want this block device to be SATA or IDE, which is the most compatible, or if the operating system supports it, you can do vert IO, uh, which removes some of the overhead of having to emulate a piece of hardware and software so that things actually run better. But even using vert IO, the performance is not where it should be because of unoptimizations of the Ryzen platform and in the Linux kernel. So even as of today, like on the Linux kernel mailing list, I can see traffic from, AM, from engineers at AMD and others that are interested in solving the problem. You know, as of like June 5th, patching IOMMU and patching some of the things around IOMMU to do with those types of IO transfers. Now that IOMMU is broken, now it's perfectly usable with the Agiza update, which is awesome. So huge kudos to AMD, this is great news. But there's still a little bit of work to be done. But if you're an early adopter and you don't mind getting your hands dirty, 
it is acceptable performance, but the performance will get better. And if you're a speed junkie, well, you can always dual boot and boot the Linux virtual machine and be up and going with that as well. So it's fine. Now there is also a workaround that you can do with the IO performance limitations. You can pass through the entire device to the virtual machine. So the same way that you're gonna pass through the graphics card, you could pass through the PCI Express SATA controller or NVMe storage. So fortunately on the Gigabyte Gaming 5 and the ASRock Tai Chi X370, the NVMe shows up in its own IOMMU group, meaning that you can just assign it to the virtual machine and the host Linux operating system will go hands off. The Tai Chi X370 has the added bonus that you can uh, assign the Asmedia add-in SATA controller, which is built into the motherboard, to the virtual machine as well because it is also in its own IOMMU group. So you could plug your Windows SSD into that Asmedia SATA controller. And because that SATA controller is completely separated from everything else on the motherboard, you can give up entire control of that controller to the virtual machine. And so the same way that you're passing through the graphics card, you pass through that specific SATA controller. And in so doing, you get much better performance because the hardware doesn't have to deal with the, the layer of uh, the Linux host operating system dealing with it. And so whatever driver inefficiency is or whatever unoptimization there exists on the Ryzen platform right now, you basically bypass that. So know that that option is available to you. Also note that you can do the same thing with USB. So, uh, you know, the VM host gets a little squirrely if you add more than four devices. I think they may have disabled more than four devices, USB devices for pass-through, but you can totally pass through a USB controller. So you can get a PCI Express by one add-in controller for USB. Certain ones work better than other ones. Be sure to check the forum thread for specifics um, in terms of like USB support. So you can actually pass through an entire USB controller to your virtual machine, and that is a little bit better situation in terms of latency and gaming, and that sort of thing. You can do the same thing with USB sound cards. If you've got a USB headset versus onboard audio, because sometimes getting onboard audio to work without crackling can be a little tricky, it can be a little difficult. But all in all, this setup works surprisingly well. Now one thing I like about the Gigabyte motherboard is that it actually has two wired gigabit ethernet controllers. Now they are in the same IOMMU group, meaning that you have to pass them through together or use a patch to deal with that. Now so what about graphics card configurations? Well we've been testing with lots of different graphics cards. We use an Asus Strix RX 570 uh, AMD graphics card. We used a Gigabyte um, 550 RX 550 graphics card. We've used an XFX RX 480 graphics card. We've used a, a Founders Edition GTX 1080. We've also used a Gigabyte RX 460 and the Radeon Pro W7100 in varying combinations. Now, of course, the Radeon cards, both the Radeon Pro and the RX series cards will work fine in the virtualization scenario. Uh, the Founders Edition GTX 1080 and pretty much all NVIDIA cards by default will give you an error code 43 when you install the drivers. The reason that you get the error code is because NVIDIA is being deliberately hostile to this type of virtualization, meaning that the drivers do a check to say, hey, are we in a virtualized environment? Is somebody running this under virtualization? And if the check detects that it is, it will immediately exit code 43. Now you can defeat that by telling QEMU to lie to the guest operating system that it's not running under virtualization. And that works, and then you can install the drivers and bypass code 43. But I've, it is really difficult for me to support NVIDIA in this scenario, even though the, the 1080 and the 1070 will actually perform better than the 480, the RX 480 and the RX 580 in these scenarios, is because NVIDIA is being deliberately hostile to this type of virtualization. All right, let's take a look step by step to get this thing up and running with Fedora 26. First, you're gonna to wanna to prepare a USB stick with Fedora 26. Pretty easy, right? You just download the ISO, set up the USB, boot from it, you're good to go. Now, I would recommend unplugging all hard drives, NVMe, SSD, whatever storage devices you've got attached to the system, except for the one that you want to install Linux on. Install Fedora 26, then you'll immediately wanna do a DNF update, You know, drop to a terminal, SU to root, uh, do a DNF update, and then you're gonna to wanna to do DNF install at virtualization. 
And so this is going to install a whole bunch of packages that have to do with virtualization, including Vert Manager, which is a nice GUI for managing your QEMU and KVM virtual machines on, on this device. It'll also give you some command line utilities, VIRSH, for managing your virtual machines from the shell. The GUI is 99% complete. There's a couple of things that we have to do from the command line to work around some of the performance quirks with the, this type of virtualization. So getting started with Vert Manager. Basically, once you've got the virtualization stuff installed, you should be able to find Vert Manager. You'll just run Vert Manager and create a new virtual machine. Um, you can set up Windows on this if you want, but I would recommend actually uh, installing Windows first, like unplug all the hard drives except for the hard drive that you want to install Windows on, set up Windows on a, on a bare naked hard drive, and then create your virtual machine in here. Uh, you can go through the wizard and specify a Windows installation ISO uh, or whatever you want, but we're going to edit the XML file and manipulate it directly. We're going to add a directive in there to specify the uh, physical hardware device that we want to use. How do we know which device we want to use for the virtual machine? Well, drop to the terminal and run lsblk. So when you run lsblk, it'll list block devices on the system. You can see pretty easily which one your Linux system is using. So we can see Fedora, root, and home and stuff. That tells us that you know SD whatever that that is associated with is the drive that our Linux machine is installed on. You don't want to use that one. But here we can see NVMe or you know SD something else that is the drive that Windows is installed on. So what we're going to do is specify that device in our XML file. So we're going to go to etc and libvirt and look for our XML file that represents the virtual machine that we just created in libvirt. And we're going to edit this XML file. Now this XML file is actually generated on the fly. This is really just a reference file. It does not actually uh, mean that you know changes to this XML file is going to change stuff on the system. Uh, one other thing that we want to do while we're in here specifying which drive is the drive that we want to use for the operating system is change the, the way that the CPU parameters are. Um, so we want to use some CPU tune parameters. Now you can get these so you can copy paste it from the level one text forums but what we're doing is telling the emulation software hey we want to use CPUs 8 through 16, which is you know one core complex, it's four cores, eight threads. And then we want to define our CPU as a four core, eight thread device. And then we want to pass through what are called enlightenments, meaning that we're enlightening the virtual machine to the fact that it is virtualized. And we are going to take advantage of the Hyper-V enlightenments, because Hyper-V is Microsoft's virtualization technology. But hey, we're on Linux. We can use it. Things will run more efficiently if the virtual machine knows that it's a virtual machine rather than force us to emulate everything. So there you go. We're going to define some extra parameters in here to make everything run better. Then once we've done that, we're going to save this and we're going to run the VRISH command to redefine this virtual machine with our new parameters. So just do VRISH space define space the XML file that we just edited and that will redefine this virtual machine in ways that is difficult or impossible to do right now with the uh, vert manager GUI. And then at that point if you've already installed Windows on the uh, SSD that you plan to use for virtualization it should just boot right up. So we're going to edit the, the configuration here. Now we don't need the built-in video devices so we're going to remove those. We're going to add hardware and we're going to add the video card that we want to use in virtualization. So we just need to find the PCI device ID. We're going to add the graphics card and the audio card both so that the, they're available, you know, the full device is available to the virtual machine. We're also going to add USB devices. Now, I would recommend a second USB mouse and keyboard, or you can also get a USB keyboard and mouse switch so that you can toggle between your host operating system and your virtual machine. You can just use one keyboard and mouse if you want, but when you start the virtual machine, it's going to take over the mouse and keyboard, and so if something goes wrong, you may have difficulty regaining control of the system. And that's pretty much it on the software configuration side of things. If you wanted to do this on a different distribution, like Ubuntu or something like that, uh, you can. It is possible. Um, there are like Ubuntu has made some strange choices. So the Gigabyte Gaming Five, uh, when you boot with Ubuntu's kernel, it will uh, hang and do some weird stuff. But if you use a more recent Linux kernel or a vanilla Linux kernel that does not have the uh, the AMD GPIO driver that's buggy enabled. Uh, it'll boot just fine. 
So a lot of people are like, oh, it's a problem with the motherboard. Eh, not actually a problem with the motherboard, just a problem with the GPIO driver, the combination of the GPIO driver and the specific stuff that, that uh, Gigabyte is doing with the general purpose I.O. ports on Ryzen. So there you go. The next thing that you'll want to do is boot into the UEFI on your system. Now this step is different depending on which board that you have. You'll want to enable SVM, you'll want to enable IOMMU or at least set it to auto, and it's probably a good idea to enable uh, SRIOV. Now SRIOV is not something that we're actually going to use today. It stands for Single Root IO Virtualization. And what that means is you, if you have an enterprise graphics card, meaning like a server graphics card that's designed for multiple users, when you put in a single graphics card, it will actually show up to the system like as if it is multiple graphics cards. And this is the future. This is awesome because you can buy, in the future, you will be able to buy a single graphics card installed in your system and share that single graphics card between you know, your host operating system and your virtual machine. I fully believe that containerization is going to eat the computing industry's lunch. Like This is how Microsoft's monopoly will be unseated. If it's not on their radar, it soon will be, and there's, they're going to take steps to, to undermine running Windows in this type of way, either through licensing or through technical tricks like we're seeing with the, uh, the NVIDIA virtualization drivers. But you know, imagine a future where you can just run whatever inside a Windows container, and even if you need GPU acceleration, even if you, you, know, you want to run Tomb Raider at 120 FPS or GTA 5 at 120 FPS, it could totally do that inside a container. You're already using containers if you've downloaded old games from, from good old games, kind of, sort of. I mean, I'm bending the definition there a little bit, but being able to run those old DOS games, it's a little bit emulation and a little bit pass-through, but the performance of modern computers is such that, you know, you can play those old games at basically native speeds, and it's completely fine. And so imagine the future version of that where people have to do less work to containerize those kinds of things. And then you start to understand why this technology is so exciting to me and why I'm willing to jump through some hoops to be able to run this kind of thing today. If my computer is a consumer electronics, just a piece of consumer electronics that has some data on it, I don't really care about the operating system. Windows, OS 10, I don't really care. For the computers that are an extension of my mind, that are, that are, that are storing stuff that is me, I don't really trust any operating system that I can't can't really get my hands in. So things like Linux, FreeBSD, free and open operating systems. I don't know, I just like the ideals. I like the ideals of, of, of those kinds of things. So there you go. Well, anyway, back to what we have to do. Once you've got the virtualization tasks installed, there's a couple of things that we need to do. One is we need to edit the kernel boot line. So we need to tell the Linux kernel that we want to enable IOMMU and some other options. Now be sure to check the forum for the full step-by-step -step guide. I'm gonna have some stuff here on the screen, but you know, honestly following this in a video format, not really my cup of tea, but there is an article on the website, and so you should check that out at level1text.com. But for now, it's like, okay, here's the thing that you need to enable. Now the next thing that we wanna do is modify the boot process so that we tell Linux what's going on with this. And so for me to do that, I wanna to explain to you how the boot process works. So when your computer's booting up, the UEFI does the low-level initialization and then needs to hand it off to the operating system. On an EFI system or UEFI system, uh, that's sort of a quote-unquote modern process for handing off control from the, the, the boot UEFI, whatever the motherboard manufacturer has provided and all the little modules that go with that, to the operating system, and Linux in our case. And so uh, Linux needs to know about the hardware. There need to be modules for the hardware so that it can actually like boot up and uh, find the devices and find enough devices to continue booting and, and those kinds of things. So we need to tell Linux not to load the driver for our secondary graphics card because if Linux loads the driver for a secondary graphics card, we're not gonna be able to use it for our virtual machine because that would be a problem. You can't have two drivers running at once on the same graphics card unless it's SRIOV. So, you know, you've got to, there's got to be some communication mechanism for that. And, you know, normally you could pass it through when you're loading the module, but by then it's too late. Like, that, that occurs actually pretty late in the boot process. So Fedora actually has a pretty cool mechanism for dealing with this. We're going to go into the etc. folder where our configurations are, and we're going to go into modules.d, which is where you can define parameters for modules and modules that, that you want to load. 
we need to load a module called VFIO and we need to tell VFIO what devices we want it to bind to. Well, we can tell it what devices by device ID. In order to determine which PCI Express IDs we need to add to the vert IO driver, we're going to use LSPCI. So we've got LSPCI, we just run LSPCI-NN and this will give us the the name of the device, where it is on the system, and then the device ID. It's, you know, four hex numbers colon four other hex numbers. This device ID is the vendor, like the brand of a card, and then the device ID, the specific device ID for a particular card. So what we're going to do is just write those down or copy to the clipboard or whatever for the devices that we want to pass through. Now most graphics cards have an audio device as well, and that's in the same IOMMU group. So you'll want to pass the graphics card and the audio component of the graphics card. If you're not really sure about your IOMMU groups, um, you should run this LS IOMMU script, which I think is from the Arch Wiki, and you can see how your IOMMU devices are grouped together. This will give you a hint about if this is gonna work or not before you actually do the work in, in doing it. We've got the IOMMU output for the Gigabyte Gaming 5 here, as well as the Tai Chi X370. And you can see that, you know, before the last Giza update, the IOMMU groups were almost identical between these two boards. And now they're actually more different than they were, reflecting the different onboard peripherals that are available with these two different boards, which is actually a pretty good situation. That gives us the option to pass through other devices like the SATA controller, the Asmedia SATA controller that's on board, and even other PCI Express peripherals that we might add into the system. Now with our device IDs, we can set about modifying the VFIO kernel module options. Now if you've got two graphics cards that are the same device ID, that's a little trickier of a situation. There's another thing that you can run at boot time with a shell script to tell it to bind to it by where the device appears on the system, but I'm not going to cover that in the video. That'll be a thing for the forum, so check that out. We're just going to define the PCI Express IDs here of the secondary graphics card that we've got in the system so that when Linux boots it doesn't load the driver for that instead it loads VFIO and VFIO is really just a stub driver so that the the virtual machine can come along and attach to it and VFIO is not going to interfere with with whatever the virtual machine is doing with the hardware so this is actually not super complicated the next thing we want to do is modify our KVM parameters here you can see that there are options for the AVIC and the nested uh, page tables in PT. I'm going to disable both of those. This is something you should experiment regularly with though. Um, experiment after a kernel updates and different patches and things like that because if we get to a point where the software has been updated and optimized, enabling nested page tables and the AVIC is probably going to solve the uh, I.O. performance issues that I was mentioning before with, with vert I.O. and that kind of thing. If you had uh, additional PCI Express IDs that you wanted to specify uh, in the vert IO configuration file. Uh, you totally can do that, like a, for a SATA controller or something like that. It's just a comma separated list. Now you might think that this is enough. Once you've modified the, the kernel parameters, you're good to go. But no, think about what I was saying about the boot process. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. So the, the, the system UEFI, the boot, hands off to Linux. So you get the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel doesn't have the modules by default in most distributions, although you can compile it in, to handle the hardware to be able to actually, you know, get on with the boots, like to see the hard drive, the file system drivers, you know, there's not, there's not really a lot there. So there's a step that uh, historically was called the initial RAM disk, meaning that there's a little zip file of, or a targz file or whatever you want to call it, of all of the drivers and the stuff that the kernel really needs in order to boot, and then the rest of the stuff occurs later. So like if you have a video capture card, eh, that's probably not gonna be part of the initial RAM disk, but you know that might be loaded later once it's actually mounted the root file system and continued on with booting. With VFIO, we really need that to load early. So what do we do? Because we just modified the kernel module, and if we reboot now, it's not gonna work because the configuration files don't make any difference because they're on the root file system Linux can't actually see the root file system this early in the boot process. So, you know, mentally you should be thinking about, okay, Linux is going to need to know that the, the, the driver for the graphics card should be claimed by VFIO, but I just mo modified the modprobe.d, haven't done anything with the initial RAM disk, 
So the kernel as it exists at boot time is not gonna know about these changes that I just made. We'll enter Dracut, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but it's D-R-A-C-U-T. Dracut will read your module configuration and produce all of the stuff necessary to fill in you know, that initial RAM disk to get you to sort of solve the chicken and egg problem so that when the kernel is booting, it's got this configuration and it knows what you need and you're not necessarily doing something quite as clumsy as passing through the Linux kernel you know, command line to enable the IOMMU. So like the kernel command line is like really early and slightly almost as early is the initial RAM disk dercut thing so that the kernel knows what to do. So we've done all that, we'll run this, that will regenerate this, so we're almost ready to reboot. The next thing that we need to do is just regenerate our grub config. So you can use grub2-mk config with a command like this to regenerate our EFI config. Now, uh, by default on Fedora 26, there's a sim link in the etc. folder that will link to the EFI folder where your actual grub configuration is. So we'll run grub mk2 config and point it to that sim link, which is then wherever it needs to be and you know and that's it this this sounds like a lot but this is actually not really too bad it's like you know just sort of a quick recap modified our default grub file and created our kernel uh, module configurations for vfio and kvm and run cut to regenerate our initial ram disk stuff and related stuff and that's not technically correct for me to call it the initial ram disk because it's a lot it's a little bit more than that but i'm old leave me alone <laughs> and uh, and then regenerate our, our grub configuration. It's like four steps. This is way less complicated than the Skylake walkthrough that I did on Arch a while back. And if you are on Arch, actually things have gotten better on Arch too, so maybe I should do an updated tutorial for Arch and Ubuntu. Ubuntu's not bad, really. You just need a, a recent kernel, like a really recent kernel. And that's the great thing about Fedora is you get the really, really recent kernel and that's why this works. Because Ryzen's so new, you gotta have new everything. I mean, that's how this works. So with this, you can sort of help slay the demon that is proprietary software without giving up GTA 5 and Witcher 3 and you know whatever else you might want to run. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. There's a full guide in the forum. Come to the Level 1 forums if you need help. But uh, if you're going to buy the hardware for this based on our guide, please do use our affiliate links because that helps us out a whole bunch. So you can you know pick up your hardware on Amazon or wherever with our affiliate links and then we will get a very small commission. And uh, you know this, this is our, our recommended hardware. Now that's just a quick look at these two systems. I hope to be adding more hardware to the tested known good, tested compatible list at level one techs. So if you're buying a machine for this, be sure to check that out because not all motherboards are created equal. Not every motherboard supports error correcting memory. Not every motherboard implements the same onboard peripherals the same way. So if you're building this or you're thinking about doing this, come check out the forum thread at Level 1 Text. You know, post, ask questions, whatever you want to do. I'll be there, and it's important to me that you have a good experience with Linux, and especially virtualization if you're going to undertake this. Now, that said, you know, with the, the caveats and the wrinkles, I still don't think this is for the faint of heart. You, you have to really want this. You have to really sort of want the ideals for this. It's way easier than it used to be, but the Ryzen platform still has a couple of small shortcomings. That said, the performance is good enough for me, so I'm taking steps to do stuff with this. I'm going to wait and see how Threadripper is too, because I think on Threadripper, this is probably going to be a much better experience because these types of features are much more important to the enterprise. So I can't wait to test this on Threadripper as well. But still, for what this is, Ryzen 7, $1,700, you know, $325, give or take, American for eight cores, and this level of performance and what I'm seeing here in terms of stability, it's hard to beat it. it it's actually genuinely impressive. It's really pretty neat. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out. You can find me on the forums.